Now, in contrast to direct instruction, we have project-based learning. So, in direct instruction, it's generally teacher-focused, teacher-controlled. In project-based learning, we progressively try to give more agency to students. Now, of course, for very young students, um, it is still very often very teacher-centric, um, where the teacher guides them through and takes them through a series of steps. So, for example, the first time students might use a hot glue gun, you would probably have that as a very teacher-centered approach, even though it may be project-based, where you would um, give them direct instruction on what they should do at each stage for their own safety, but also sometimes to learn various processes. And as students gain more capability and confidence, and you as a teacher have more confidence in your students' capabilities, you can then open up and allow them to have more um, control and engagement with the project-based learning process. Now we call this um, extrinsic and intrinsic project-based learning. So in extrinsic project-based learning, the decisions are generally made by the teacher. Okay, you are going to build a bridge. It's going, you've got these materials. You have to use this type of um, suspension design. Um, you've got to incorporate at least 20 paddle pop sticks on the base and use these wires to form the framing and so forth. So while the students can still incorporate some skill and creativity, it's rather limited in that you have guided them and structured things so that they are going to produce what essentially you want them to produce. Now that can be for very good pedagogical reasons. You want to teach certain skills, you want to teach certain processes that students need to master. What it has difficulty with though, is in developing students' creativity and often their engagement with the task. Whereas intrinsic project-based learning relies upon students' own intrinsic interests and tries to promote and foster that. So it would be, um, often we would set a, a creative setting. We've got all of these animals on one side of the island and the volcano is about to erupt and they need to be able to get to the other side of the island. And you need to come up with a way of them getting there. These are all the materials we have available. There's no other materials. And you've got to come up with a solution for them to get across this lava filled chasm. Now, from that, students might decide, OK, let's build a balloon. Let's see if the materials we have, we can make a balloon. Or we might try to make a catapult and launch ourselves across the chasm that way. Or they may decide a bridge is the best solution. Now, often we will seed certain ideas into their minds. So before the lesson, we might have given them a whole lot of an activity where they were looking at bridges and different bridge designs and so forth. So it might guide them towards a solution that helps them achieve the content descriptors we want them to develop and the various concepts we want to do. But as much as possible, we'll try to make it open-ended and allow students' creativity to come up with new and interesting ways of solving that problem. Now, the danger there is that there will be failures. Some teachers see failures as a negative. In technologies education, we should always see failures as a fantastic opportunity to have learnt something new. We have learnt what doesn't work. And that is a great way of learning. Something that our education system doesn't do well with. We tend to see failure as purely a negative. In learning, it is actually a very strong positive. The old adage, we learn more from our mistakes than from our successes, is absolutely true. And we've got the Vygotsky's model of zones of possible development, where we should always be trying to do things just beyond what we've previously been able to show that we could do. Because that's where learning occurs, in that space where we're not certain we can do it or not. If we already know we can do it and we're certain about that, then learning will not occur. Of course, we've already learned how to do it. So putting students into that space, that uncertainty, does engage with risk. And you need to be able to create a learning environment in project-based learning where that risk is embraced and celebrated. And students taking that risk, even if they fail, will still achieve learning outcomes. And that is why in technologies education, we measure and we assess the process, not the outcome. The fact that they their bridge collapsed doesn't mean that they've actually failed the learning objectives. 
if they have learnt about how to use triangles in the formation of their structure and um, a whole range of other learning outcomes that may be important in terms of learning about the materials and the strengths and weaknesses of different types of materials and so forth, that learning process may actually be enhanced by the failure of their solution. It's a difficult thing to get your head around, but we should always be looking at how to celebrate failure because that's where learning can really occur. Okay, so provided you have a couple of examples of different types of project-based learning environments, um, one with uh, Quidditch and one with Bbots, so you can have a look at those. Um, have a look at the concept of Vygotsky's Zone of Proximal Development. Every teacher should know this. It's one of the fundamental theories that um, is foundational to education. And then moving on from project-based learning, there are different variations. Now, project-based learning is just one of many different types of inquiry-framed learning. There's problem-based learning. There's scientific inquiry models. There's a whole range of different um, approaches around this type of learning. Uh, there's also a subset of project-based learning called challenge-based learning. Now, in this, it's very much around intrinsic-based project-based learning, where students um, identify the problem to be solved. And that's one of the main focuses of the task, actually finding the problem. So often in project-based learning and other areas of education, we give the students the problem to solve. In the real world, I shouldn't say that, school is the real world for our students and for teachers. Um, but in the world outside of schools, uh, very often the main focus is around identifying the problem. The actual solution to it, once it's been identified, is often relatively trivial. It's that identification of the problem to be solved that is a key focus. So that's where project, oh, sorry, challenge-based learning is really having its strength. So have a look at it, and it's um, a very detailed process. Um, and it's been well documented and researched and shown to be very effective. So that's um, project-based learning. And you need to think about it in comparison to activity-based learning, which we frame as direct instruction as one of the main models within that. And the two of them represent uh, essential elements of technology's education. Now, project-based learning generally cannot be achieved without some activity-based direct instruction learning. Of course, direct instruction learning and activity-based learning is really good at setting foundational knowledge and foundational processes. If you're learning how to use a hammer, generally you'll go through a very strict direct instruction process where the teacher is going to um, clearly and explicitly teach you how to use a hammer. You don't want to have that as an exploratory process whereby Obviously, mistakes could be made, and those mistakes could have uh, consequences that we don't want to actually explore. But activity-based direct instruction is not particularly good at what we call the higher order thinking skills. So in Bloom's um, taxonomy, the lower order thinking skills are knowledge and um, simple procedures. And activity-based direct instruction is great at doing that. But once we go to the higher order thinking skills of analysis and synthesis and creativity, that's where project-based learning outshines um, direct instruction and activity-based learning. So think about those two approaches and you'll discuss them in the workshop.